I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the bag lunch uh, from the Friends of Archaeology. It's been interesting. We've had an almost seamless uh, technical preparation for most of our bag lunch presentations and lecture series. This one, we've been fighting a recalcitrant microphone. So my hope is that we're all coming through clearly and that everything is actually working. This uh, topic of today's presentation um, is something that is current. It's not the nuts and bolts of prehistory, so it's a little different from what I'm used to presenting. Um, it's going to be a little challenging in some ways, both for me and for you, because some of the ideas behind it are complex. Uh, when I sort of dreamed this up, I put together the title of Archaeology History and the Challenge of Identity. And that's appropriate, but it's, um, it does hint at uh, sort of some of the underlying issues. And a lot of it we're going to take uh, from the concept of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Now, if you sense a little pause right here, it's because I am trying to get my little uh, arrows to work and to advance the slides. And it's not happening the way it's supposed to. So I am going to disappear and grab a mouse. I'll be right back. How's that? If anybody can see me and if this actually seems to be working, uh, put a thumbs up. All right, we're on. So, uh, archaeology as a discipline is part of American society. Um, it is in context uh, and it is not apolitical. And in today's world, we are buffeted by the concept of American exceptionalism, which has been a political uh, football uh, sort of in recent times. We are not immune from the questions of uh, uh, anti-racism movements uh, in the country. Uh, we are in some ways undermined by a general lack of appreciation in American culture for history and the complexity of uh, history. Uh, and we're also caught on the edge of deregulation movements in terms of how they impact historic preservation. Uh, so archaeology is, although we could wish it was apolitical, it isn't. And uh, we are part of the greater fabric of the society in which we work. Um, as a discipline, uh, we come directly out of Euro-American knowledge traditions. Um, we have in the history of archaeology as a discipline, a very tainted uh, participation in uh, racism. A lot of the early motivation for archaeology uh, was to try to demonstrate the superiority of Euro-American culture and the inferiority of non-Western cultures. Uh, archaeology was in many cases an, either an explicit or more often an uh, implicit participant in cultural repression. Uh, there's sort of a local example, if you will, of Edgar Lee Hewitt excavating at Pouye, where when uh, the Santa Clara labor he had hired to excavate 
uh, objected to some of his treatment of burials. He was more than willing to ignore the substance of their complaint and uh, hire San Ildefonso labor instead. So, you know, this sort of uh, idea of uh, we know best, uh, which is uh, in some senses a form of ethnocentrism. Uh, and then there's always been an, a sort of an overtone of an assertion that what archaeologists learn, believe, and promote is truth in the sense of privileged knowledge, especially when compared with uh, oral tradition. Uh, when we think of uh, folk history as being biased and uh, our scientific archeology span as being somehow uh, better than, more accurate than, more valid than other renditions of history. Uh, social justice has caught up with archaeology progressively through really the centuries. Um, I do want to give credit to anthropology as a whole because uh, anthropology debunked the concept of racism as uh, something real back in the early part of the last century. But archaeology has been slowly moving forward and getting uh, sort of a better sense of uh, our social responsibilities. Uh, I'm going to pick on NAGPRA because NAGPRA was developed and passed as social justice legislation in a large part. Um, it is motivated for all the right reasons, but because it had to be implemented through a legislative process, it represents a whole series of compromises for different constituencies. And NAGPRA is Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, federal legislation, and it uh, I've been uh, in the past and today, I'm a critic of NAGPRA, not of what its intentions are, but of how we have implemented it. Although I'll also say that I don't think it could have been implemented any other way than the way it has been developed since it was passed in 1990. Uh, the purpose of this was to redress uh, some of the excesses of archaeology, specifically around uh, Native American uh, burials and the treatment of Native American burials. But it also addressed museum collections, museum behavior, uh, large collections that were made of um, items that were important to living peoples in terms of their contemporary cultural values. Uh, so that's where it goes beyond graves to cover a lot of other um, sensitive materials and issues. Um, what NAGPRA does is, first of all, we have to remember that it's limited to Native Americans. Um, if you're not a federally recognized tribe, uh, you're not explicitly part of the process, although the process has developed and refined itself through the years so that there's more opportunity to, for non-federally recognized tribes to participate. Uh, the first <clears throat> uh, qualification for people who can participate in the NAGPRA process uh, are lineal descendants. Uh, this dealt with a lot of situations where, say, on the battlefield, uh, an individual warrior may have been uh, collected and put into a museum. Uh, 
uh, as the human remains of a particular warrior. The first qualified uh, people to lay claim to or uh, repatriate that are lineal descendants, um, the relatives of that person. The second, uh, in the absence of lineal descendants, tribal sovereigns are the next uh, category of uh, participants in the NAG pr process. And tribal sovereigns have used that term specifically because in classic Euro-American uh, cultural biases, land ownership trumps everything. So that if you own the land on which an archaeological site resides, you are the sovereign if you are a tribe. And even if the site can be demonstrably linked to a different federally recognized tribe, they can only assert uh, a relationship with that site with the permission of and of the land owning tribe. So one conflict that is common in the implementation of NAGPRA is that the ancestral population that may be linked to an archaeological site uh, may not be the owners of that site because so much territory has changed, uh, so much of the geography of cultural boundaries has changed over the past really thousands of years. Um, and uh, that creates conflicts within the narrow definition of the law. It doesn't need to create a conflict, but the con potential of the conflict is there. Uh, since so much of the territory of the United States is outside of sovereign territory of tribes, uh, whether it's private land or BLM land or Forest Service land, well, we can take the private land off the table briefly and think just in terms of federal lands the next level of relationship is cultural affiliation. So we have lineal descendants, we have tribes that own land on which there's archaeology, or we have cultural affiliated tribes that can demonstrate a descendant relationship to uh, the archaeological materials of interest. Now, the materials of interest are uh, human remains, uh, paramount. Uh, the associated funerary objects that go with those uh, human remains. But then there are also in the museum context, and some of those museum contexts come from archaeological work, archaeological collections. And those are sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony. So that's really the umbrella of uh, uh, social justice that was created in statute to try to begin to redress some of the historic problems that have developed from archaeology as, a, as it has been practiced over the past century or so. NAGPRA is reactive. Uh, it deals with things that are and have been in museum collections. It has to deal with uh, inadvertent discoveries on federal lands. Uh, it is proactive in the sense that the concerns that are expressed in NAGPRA uh, need to be planned into federal undertakings. Um, it entails a consultation process and most important in those consultation processes are the agreements that the federal agencies broker uh, 
with the tribes over how human remains uh, will be treated, um, but also sacred materials. But most people's concerns relate to human remains. So reactive in the sense of pre-existing collect collections, uh, proactive in the sense of future archaeological work, but in most cases, and there are uh, the regulators, National Park Service, et cetera, are coming up with more and more creative ways to apply uh, the NAGPRA consultation processes to non-federal and uh, non-tribal lands. Um, but by and large, uh, NAGPRA is applicable to federal land owning entities uh, that poses some internal conflicts. Uh, the Navajo Nation explicitly uh, privileges its own laws and regulations over federal laws and regulations, asserting tribal sovereignty so that they do not feel that they are bound by NAGPRA if NAGPRA uh, policies and regulations conflict with their own uh, legal interpretations of how archaeology should be handled or conducted. Even though it is social justice uh, legislation, uh, NAGPRA is a colonial imposition. In other words, everyone recognizes our social responsibility, at least we hope everyone recognizes it. But the only way we can implement that is through a, a set of colonial institutions. As a result, there can be tremendous frustration on uh, the Native American side where they see the goal, the social, social justice goals as being very clearly defined. But to get there, you have to go through a very, very bureaucratic process. So uh, NAGPRA consultations can be slow, they can be cumbersome, even when everyone recognizes a particular tribe is having a descendant relationship to a particular cultural resource you still need to go through the process of asking every other tribe if they are, if they have their own interests in it and if they concur with the uh, decisions of the agency and who they want to consult with or who they want to associate uh, archeological materials with. Uh, there are agency in uh, idiosyncrasies. For a while in uh, the Forest Service, there, were, uh, there was a tendency for uh, a very, very hard line to be drawn on who was uh, culturally related to archeological materials. Whereas other agencies, often the Park Service, felt that it was their responsibility to open the doors wide and to create or allow uh, or define cultural affiliation relationships with uh, a, almost any tribe that would assert a position of descendants. And this obviously can create conflicts within tribes sometimes, especially when there's uh, historical uh, enmity between tribes. Uh, but it's uh, the agency idiosyncrasies are a, create sort of an, an uneven or conflicting playing field that can sometimes confuse tribes because the results of one particular consultation with an agency can look very different than the results of a, a consultation with a different agency.
Um, there are always the problems of culturally unaffiliated remains. Uh, agencies would sometimes draw that boundary in different places. Uh, and as a result of some of the frustrations and excesses of cultural affiliation or lack of cultural affiliation, really, uh, decisions by agencies. Um, there has been a movement to uh, basically come to the conclusion that all Native American remains are culturally affiliated and to accept uh, arguments of cultural affiliation that don't require demonstrations of uh, specific evidentiary lines of relationship. And uh, that's where we are today in many contexts. And that's the, con the circumstances in which many uh, human remains are being repatriated from uh, museum collections. And I shouldn't say many, that's an overgeneralization because I think tribes are uh, motivated in different ways to adopt uh, processes and claims under culturally unaffiliated uh, mechanisms. Another point of frustration from tribes with NAGPRA is that it really doesn't give tribes uh, control over general archaeology. It's so specific to the issues of human remains and potentially sacred materials that um, we have the issue of uh, is a broken mono or a matate subject to NAGPRA? Are general collections of uh, archaeological artifacts subject to NAGPRA? In a technical sense, the answer is no. Um, and yet, the boundary between what is secular and what is sacred is very, very different between the native perspective and the Euro-American perspective. Um, uh, NAGPRA really was written relatively narrowly so that if you can say that a particular uh, artifact used in a modern ritual that is housed in a museum, if you can demonstrate that, you can claim it. But it has to appeal to that sense of definition of what is religiously important and what may not be religiously important. And that's uh, a Western or Euro-American uh, definition in many cases, most cases, I should say. Um, another uh, issue is that the in its original sort of uh, conception, NAGPRA sort of assumed that it was there to resolve uh, disputes between tribes, especially over uh, potentially sacred materials in museum collections. So that cultural affiliation uh, also could be implemented in ways that was cultural de-affiliation where an agency or a museum would find itself under pressure to say, no, you are not affiliated with this. Instead, this tribe over here is. And that sets tribes against each other. Uh, it puts museums and archeologists in a difficult position of in some senses, uh, no win. Um, also, there are issues of uh, wh who is more important, tribal concerns or descendant concerns, which sometimes ignores the incredibly complex history of families, of communities, of uh, cultural groups. Um, The other sort of side to it is 
because there was the idea of you're either affiliated or not affiliated, NAGPRA lacked in its initial development a ranking of affiliation in the sense of uh, beyond the point of are you descendant, directly descendant from an individual uh, or not? Uh, do you privilege uh, a cultural affiliation that might be based on language similarity in the past, cultural similarity in the past, land ownership in the past? Uh, how there is, as we'll see in a little bit, there's a sharing of religious institutions so that if in recent times a religious institution has been adopted, does that allow a particular tribe to push their cultural affiliation arguments all the way back in the past to when that cultural institution, that religious institution, uh, first appears in um, an archaeological record. So it's, you know, it's a very, very complicated and uh, can be very, very uh, frustratingly bureaucratic process. Now, I made the point a little earlier that I don't think it could have uh, played out any other way than it did. And we work with what we've been given. And I actually think that the cultural affiliation mandate within the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act really can be extremely useful in allowing us to understand group identity between the past and the present, that uh, they, that all of the structure is there, even if it's not defined in terms of how you say some tribe is more affiliated than another tribe, that doesn't exist. But all of the data necessary to think think about cultural affiliations in those terms is there in the uh, regulations. So cultural affiliation should consider geographical relationships between modern tribes and past, kinship relationships, biological, archaeological, language, folklore, Oral tradition, historical evidence, or other information or ex expert opinion. Um, this is really a very, very inclusive list that allows everyone to uh, really come to terms with the complexity of relationships between the past and the present. And can it allows us to come to terms with it in ways that I think can be respectful, depending upon the attitudes we take uh, toward it. Uh, another important example is that this is not evidentiary argument as you would encounter in a court of criminal law, it's more the evidentiary arguments that you encounter in civil law where you don't have to prove something beyond the shadow of a doubt. All you have to do is demonstrate that there really is a valid argument uh, that can be drawn that will establish a relationship between past peoples and modern peoples. This is a quick little set of examples of uh, uh, what we deal with through time. And remember that uh, NAGPRA was uh, signed and began to be taken seriously in 1990. 
Uh, we're talking uh, really 30, more than 30 years of implementation. And these sorts of documents were created by individual parks in these cases, trying to come up with uh, fulfilling their responsibilities to tribes, linking their holdings in the way of uh, park collections with uh, uh, modern tribal consultants so that they could begin consultation and resolve questions of uh, affiliation and disposition of things like human remains or those uh, uh, sacred uh, sorts of materials. Um, I throw up the Animus La Plata cultural uh, resource, uh, cultural affiliation study as the last uh, because it exemplified one of the weaknesses of NAGPRA, which there's a tendency to think that when these decisions are made, that they are actually uh, real, truthful, or final products. In uh, For those of you who caught Dean Wilson's uh, uh, bag lunch previously, he was able to draw connections between the ancestral populations of the greater Durango, Colorado area, um, the Animas River Valley, and bringing them forward, ultimately uh, making an argument that there's cultural linkages all the way to the modern Hamas peoples. Uh, in this cultural affiliation study that was focused on the archeological resources of the Anima Soplata project, a federally funded project uh, just uh, in the Durango vicinity, uh, that cultural affiliation study actually de-affiliated the Hamas people from being primary consultants on the remains that came from the Animus La Plata project that were encountered during the archaeology there. And th the accident of information that resulted in the de-affiliation was that when interviewed, the Hamas cultural specialists emphasized their sense of oral tradition and origins, which placed their origin not in uh, the Durango area, the Animas Valley, but placed their origin somewhere to the north and west of Cortez, Colorado. And there was this sort of leap from uh, something much, much closer to the Four Corners area to the modern Hamas as if it were a straight line without looking at the totality of evidence as Dean did in his presentation, where if you work through all of the intervening information that really the Hamas people may have originally in the archaic had their sense of identity established in the Four Corners area, much closer to the Four Corners area. But that does not preclude them from having ancestral populations in the Animas River Valley uh, in the Durango area. Um, for those of you who took my class, there's the, I was able to sort of elaborate even more strongly in there. Now, ultimately, the cultural affiliation study uh, came to the conclusion that the principal consultants that should be involved in disposition decisions on Animus La Plata materials were uh, the Karis Pueblos, Akama, uh, 
uh, took the lead on that. I can actually make an archaeological argument that that decision is correct for some time periods, but not for the totality of the archaeological materials that were recovered from the Animus La Plata uh, project. And it's There is a tendency in the way NAGPRA was implemented from its very beginning to draw one-to-one -one relationships and in some senses not pay enough attention to the potential of the historical development of Southwestern peoples to uh, create a far more nuanced and complicated uh, cultural affiliation landscape. And as you can probably guess, that's sort of where I'm headed uh, with this particular talk. Uh, there's been a tendency to think of an inherent conflict between the interests of n contemporary Native American peoples and archaeologists so that archaeological histories end up being uh, de-emphasized, if you will, uh, in terms of trying to uh, develop cultural affiliation models. And what I'd like to see is sort of the reinstatement of that. I mean, we have in the Southwest, we have an incredible diversity of Native American peoples. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. It's one of the reasons that I'm here and I value every bit of the diversity that we see around us today. Um, that diversity is uh, in some ways most strongly represented in terms of the language diversity of uh, contemporary peoples, uh, remembering that our, uh, even that upper level of these branching trees uh, don't encapsulate the sovereignty variety that we have in modern peoples. Uh, so we're just looking at language here. It, we would have uh, many, many, many more destination ellipses uh, if we were to think in terms of uh, federally recognized tribes. Uh, in the, uh, if we want to throw a little tiny dot on this map for, say, Bandelier National Monument, uh, it will coincide with a linguistic territory at the time of Euro-American contact, and that's what this represents. But the dynamic nature of the distribution of peoples across the landscape is absolutely remarkable. So that uh, maybe the easiest way to think of it is to look at the Comanche. Uh, this is, uh, you can see Comanche territory off to the right of the Pueblo world in this language family map. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you do not have uh, Comanche being intimately interested in things that are happening in the Rio Grande Valley, in things that are happening in the Galisteo Basin, in things that are uh, happening deep into Texas and potentially deep into Mexico. Um, these boundaries that we draw uh, look remarkably real, look remarkably static, but we would have very, very different boundaries if we pushed the time slice of this map back 
two generations, three generations, five generations. Uh, it would be more like uh, sort of amoebas working their way across the landscape. And that's really the, the model that we have. Plus, cultural affiliation, because it includes things like religious institutions, one of the most marvelous characterizations of Native peoples, especially here in the Southwest, is that Native American culture, by and large, doesn't hold to the very, very strict boundaries that Euro-American culture does. And my example is that Euro-American culture really doesn't allow you to be a Jew and a Baptist at the same time. But in Native American religious belief, often it is syncretic, where a group choosing to fuse with an existing village, their permission to join can be based on whether or not they are bringing something of religious and ceremonial value to the host village. And through that process of bringing value in religious institutions from community to community across language groups, we have this incredibly complex set of relationships where religious materials, religious institutions are shared between groups, have different roles, but similar appearances between uh, cultural groups. And uh, to the point where uh, individuals are, can be from one Pueblo can be trained at another Pueblo in the esoteric qualities of religious performance. But what that means is the religion is, in a descendant sense, present in both tribal communities and in an ancestral sense, both of those communities, even though they speak different languages, have different organizations of their cultural elements, all of them can trace their important religious institutions back to common ancestors that are deep in time. So there's this, the realities of culture are that we have, uh, we can't simply draw tree-like linear connections between the past and the present in ways that are familiar and comfortable to uh, Euro-American archaeologists or uh, bureaucrats. Partly the complexity that we face is due to climate and the incredible dynamic nature of climate change in the Southwest that encouraged uh, large-scale movements, uh, large-scale adjustments of territorial boundaries between uh, cultural groups in the past. Um, we have a uh, complicating factor in modern um, conceptions of uh, tribal identity in that even though archaeologists rarely agree on how to construct population estimates, there are is remarkable agreement between archaeologists in terms of documenting a 80% uh, loss of population uh, between prehistoric peaks of population and the populations of especially northern New Mexico at the time of Euro-American contact. That incredible demographic collapse adjusts boundaries between peoples, it adjusts co-residence, it 
creates opportunities for new religious institutions. It creates, it destroys existing uh, religious institutions in some cases. And in our uh, appeal to tribal sovereignty, land ownership uh, principles in uh, the implementation of cultural affiliation, descendants, and Native American interaction with archaeology. Uh, we have to remember that modern tribal sovereigns are the result of a uh, colonial process. And in this particular graphic, all the very, very small black dots are communities that existed. And this is probably only a subset of the totality of the communities that existed, because these are just the ones that the archaeologists knew about. Those populations, those communities existed at contact. And through the course of Spanish colonial uh, occupation and American occupation, all of those communities have been reduced down to the federally recognized tribes and pueblos that we have today. And so, uh, to use Okeawinge as an example, Okeawinge is an amalgam of people who would have occupied a much, much larger territory at the time of Spanish contact. And they represent uh, a, in the demographic collapse, uh, a survival and a reconstitution of native uh, culture, native society. Uh, all complicated by the impact of uh, Spanish uh, colonial occupation. So what I would like to see is I would like to see us graduate from looking at cultural affiliation arguments, still using NAGPRA as the cover term or cover uh, sort of bureaucracy but I would like to see us approach cultural affiliation on a regional basis, not on the basis of an individual agency, an individual institution, or even an individual collection. I would like to see us come to cultural affiliation arguments uh, in collaboration with tribes, acknowledging from both sides the incredibly sort of messiness of history that means that uh, you can have a site on the western side of the Galisteo Basin that is culturally affiliated with modern Carisan peoples. And uh, at the same time, you have Galisteo Basin Pueblos on the eastern side that have uh, arguable uh, cultural affiliations with the descendant surviving populations in the Te uh, in the Tewa Basin. And we need to acknowledge that the only way that the Tewa descendants of the Galisteo Basin residents who moved to Hopi in the early 1700s, the only way under NAGPRA that they can express their interest and concern with how archeologists treat remains from the Galisteo Basin, the only way is through the Hopi tribe, even though in the sense of Udo Aztecan languages, of strongly clan oriented religious systems, that are distinctly Hopi, that those probably had no role in the Galisteo Basin. But the only voice that the Hopi Tewa have is through the Hopi tribe.
anyway, this has covered a lot of material and it's uh, probably not as much fun as Dean's bag lunch. But uh, it's really goes to the argument of history is important and that the only way we're really going to overcome some of the modern issues of Euro-American uh, ethnocentric and racial bias is by the explicit embrace of historical relationships and the embrace of cultural relationships that are the modern derivation of those. So, uh, questions? And I'll need as a little help as I squint at. Ah, first question of. Uh, appreciating some of the maps and the sources. Uh, the map that underlies this graphic uh, is an absolutely marvelous uh, Utah, Colorado, Four Corners site, Four Corners States map with shaded relief topography, a minimum of modern uh, roads and locations on it. And it really gives you an idea of the uh, barriers to and paths of communication on a topographic landscape that has little, if anything, to do with uh, uh, modern state boundaries or anything else. The other map that figures prominently is this one. Uh, this map is from the Smithsonian's uh, uh, handbook volume focused on linguistics. And it is a snapshot of languages and language family relationships uh, at the ethnographic present, which is somewhere within the framework of, uh, you know, the, let's say the 19th century, late 19th century. There are issues with it in the sense of that white area at the bottom where it says uh, Hano Hakome and Suma Humano. Those are areas where we, where assimilation under Spanish occupation was so great and so rapid that we do not have word lists in order to classify the people who the Spanish describe as having been there. And those people have become linguistically extinct as a result, even though we know they were there. We just don't know what language classification to put them into. And that has happened uh, uh, in a number of cases around uh, the country. But uh, this is, in my mind, an extremely useful map for emphasizing uh, the importance of, uh, you know, cultural diversity within uh, North American, Native American uh, peoples. All right. When is the term archaeological site used and when is the term cultural resource site used? Mm. Do you have a response or a follow-up to Marilyn? beginning to feel that the term archaeological site sounds like the site belongs to or in some sense is in control of archaeologists. Ah, I think there's a, I think uh, Marilyn's question about the, how we use language, how we characterize things as archaeological sites, uh, that really echoes uh, a long-term uh, resentment in uh, tribal uh, perspectives that we as archaeologists have a tendency to view things totally in our own terms. Um, uh, cultural resource management um, tried to broaden itself to include things like traditional cultural properties, uh, tried to include things like um, 
a religiously important location on the landscape that shows absolutely no human modification. Its importance lies totally in the perceptions and its role in the identity and the history or oral traditions of a particular people. Well, if there is no uh, physical modification of the landscape, I, as a Euro-American archaeologist, have no clue. I have no basis to approach the question of whether or not uh, this is even archaeological. Certainly, if uh, I judge something to be unimportant, not worthy of preservation, just because I can't see it, that's a tremendous source of frustration to uh, Native American descendants. And how we deal with that, uh, first of all, you have to replace me with a new generation of archaeologists. Ideally, you have to replace me with a generation of archaeologists uh, who come from tribal communities themselves. Uh, what I would like to think and what I would like to preserve is that uh, archaeology will always be self-critical enough that I can that the models I propose for interpreting history can be evaluated, can be um, criticized, can be improved on. And even if archaeology becomes much more strongly reflective of Native American sources of information, and strongly reflective of Native American practitioners and their concerns, that it will still retain the scientific quality that I value, which is that everything we do needs to be subject to criticism. Um, in my last uh, Friends of Archaeology newsletter uh, thing, I think one of the big dangers is that we assume that Native American communities ha are immune to the same sorts of, uh, to use the worst case, uh, uh, gen genocidal um, impetuses that our own country and our own civilization can have. Uh, and all human history is a history of self-interest on particular cultural groups and how that self-interest is satisfied in the need of the group to reproduce itself both biologically and culturally. Um, we don't, we will not always get along. We will not always act as uh, if guided by a particular set of uh, values, uh, you know, uh, treating everyone as if you would like to be treated. Uh, that doesn't always work. And we need to simply acknowledge that, be open to it, and not misuse history to justify the status quo and not, uh, and be prepared to accept history as a guide to how we can do things better. Keith has a much deeper uh, sort of perspective on the development of uh, NAGPRA uh, through his uh, involvement in SAA uh, and the negotiations that went on. And his point is that uh, though archaeologists, uh, when NAGPRA was being debated and formulated, where archaeologists argued that cultural affiliation really should uh, be 
primary in terms of establishing uh, descendant uh, authority, uh, descendant privilege over uh, what happens to archaeological materials in museums, that it was the tribes themselves that pressed the sovereignty issue. I, that's completely true and acceptable to me, except that tribal sovereignty in, uh, in the conflict that tribes have found themselves in of having their geography chopped and uh, taken from them. Uh, that process has put an undue emphasis on property rights. Basically, we have given tribes no choice but to define sovereignty in terms of the control of land. And I can see why that would happen, but there, where I have seen things uh, in my perspective misused is where tribes have uh, not accommodated the cultural affiliation interests of other tribes as expressions of uh, ethnic conflict, not conflict in the sense of you know violence, but sense in the sense of conflict of interest. And often that conflict of interest isn't measured in terms of uh, mineral wealth or um, standard of living. That conflict of interest is one of uh, self-identity, how they want to think of themselves. And uh, I would, in many respects, uh, if tribes are going to embrace cultural affiliation, they're probably going to have to make that decision themselves. I agree with Keith that we can't uh, take away from them uh, the idea that they own and control the relatively minimal amounts of land that have been left to them from the Euro-American colonial process. NAGPRA is absolutely a process. I'm not sure it does broach these issues the way it's being implemented today. I do believe that we have an opportunity in New Mexico, which may be uh, unique in the uh, recent uh, court rulings and administrative rulings from the, the National Park Service uh, have placed all of the state of New Mexico unmarked burial statute procedures under the cover umbrella of NAGPRA. Uh, the New Mexico unmarked burial statute predates NAGPRA. The uh, putting decision-making control over Native American human remains, uh, uh, the, all of the processes that we have in New Mexico for state land and private land uh, were developed independently, but convergently in terms of the way we deal with it. Uh, but now the ruling is that because the state burial statute is administered by um, the uh, New Mexico Historic Preservation Office, that because the uh, uh, Historic Preservation Office accepts federal funds for a major part of its budget, that therefore the uh, Historic Preservation Office as the custodian of human remains and as a federally funded entity is therefore responsible for NAGPRA. That is uh, an obligation it's also an opportunity uh, 
because we deal with the entire state, because uh, New Mexico is dealing with private land as well as federal land, I think we do have an opportunity to develop cultural affiliation models that can be larger and potentially more historical than those that have derived through the incremental consultation processes uh, of federal agencies and uh, federal land ownership categories. Uh, so I'm hopeful that in 10 years, we'll see some of the issues that I feel, and keep in mind, I feel these issues. They aren't necessarily, uh, you know, certainly not the Museum of New Mexico, certainly not the Historic Preservation Division, uh, that I think that we will become, in many senses, I think, far more humanistic in the way we approach consultations with Native American uh, communities in New Mexico. We'll see. Well, Kennewick Man is is sort of, I mean, it's, I don't, I can't claim to be an expert on the issues involved in Kennewick Man. So what I, my perceptions are based on small snippets of information that I've garnered through the years, including presentations by the uh, tribal consortium that was finally ruled to have cultural descendants from Kennewick Man, and who finally, through the courts, um, affected the repatriation and reburial of Kennewick Man. Um, it's actually a marvelous presentation. If, if um, I ever get the chance, I'd love to have it uh, even as part of the Bag Lunch series here. Um, but Kennewick Man was a case where the federal agency presupposed a result of consultation and wanted to do the right thing, but without going through the process of uh, set forth in regulation for really uh, assessing the totality of evidence that could have been brought to bear on the situation. Uh, the Umatilla uh, had been a principal, a uh, very uh, strong voice in consultation over what should happen with Kennewick Man. The uh, Army Corps of Engineers had a long-standing relationship with them over the uh, management of dams and reservoirs within the eastern uh, Washington and uh, Idaho regions. Uh, they leapt to a conclusion that could be challenged on an evidentiary basis by archaeologists who wanted the process of cultural affiliation to be more scientific and felt that their only opportunity to study the uh, late Paleo-Indian archaic transition was going to be if they could assert an archaeological control over the process uh, of data gathering and uh, for cultural affiliation. Uh, as it turns out, the final uh, conclusion to the story of Kennewick Man did invoke uh, modern science, uh, basically against the uh, sentiments of some of the other tribes, the tribes from central Washington, the consortium, uh, recruited uh, enough individuals for genetic testing that they were able to demonstrate a genetic descendants from Kennewick Man. And that genetic descendants argument basically overcame any 
particular counter argument that anyone could offer. And so the final result was not Umatilla, which had been sort of the original uh, cultural affiliated decision that the Army Corps had advocated, but ended up being uh, the consortium of tribes uh, from central Washington. Uh, and it's, I think everybody regrets that it took Western science to come to that uh, level of support for what the tribes believed themselves from all of the other qualities of cultural affiliation arguments. Uh, so it's sort of like, damn it, why do we have to go to science to prove what we know to be true? But in this particular case, it worked, and it worked with a quality of relationship that basically was unassailable by those who would have wanted to use Western science to maintain the definition of Kennewick man as unaffiliated and to keep Kennewick man uh, out of the ground as opposed to being reburied as part of the greater social justice movement. I do recall that. Uh, I hadn't recalled that until now. I think there's uh, all kinds of marvelous issues in terms of social justice, by the way, that uh, the, the idea that a judge could find that an, that an ancient individual in North America could not be Native American just boggles the mind. Uh, but that was the argument because they tried to draw a very narrow view of what Native America actually was. To create the flip side of that argument, there's a great potential for our office to be involved in a very, very interesting issue of cultural affiliation. Because if we deal with a modern historic cemetery where we have uh, the equivalent the cultural equivalent of Henisero communities, where uh, people of Native American ancestry admixed with Spanish genetic ancestry, but living a life as part of Spanish colonial communities. When we deal with them in a biological sense, what we are drawn to are the genetic qualities that are similar between an individual of mixed heritage and Native American populations. And even if the cultural presentation of that individual had been Spanish at the time of their life and death, in death and where we have uh, biological information, we must seriously consider whether or not that individual qualifies under the greater NAGPRA umbrella. That's one of the areas where the state of New Mexico and Mark Burial Statute actually is potentially a little more attuned to social justice issues because it treats all individuals similarly, whether they are, you know, ancestors of mine that come straight off, you know, Mayflower and Anglo-Saxon derivations, whether they come from Iberia and Spain, whether they're crypto-Jewish in background or whether they're um, Franciscan in background, uh, whether they're uh, Tarascan Indians who've come up from Mexico, whether they are, uh, you know, 
immigrants from uh, Latin American countries that arrived uh, really in the past couple of generations. So there are, I, it's sort of like we can't, it's hard to apply a single formulistic approach to dealing with these issues. But if we're going to accomplish the social justice goals, we're going to have to deal with the hand we're dealt. And in this particular case, it will be NAGPRA. And in this particular case, uh, it is very likely that Native American genetically determined traits will define someone as Native American in our uh, human remains population that may not have self-identified as Native American during their life. So it's interesting. So we're checking to see what else is outstanding. If any of you have questions you'd like to deliver later on, uh, go ahead and feel free to email me. You can get to my email address from the nmarchaeology.org website uh, if you don't have my email address already. And uh, any other? Well, I thank you all for your attention and uh, watch for announcements of future uh, uh, bag lunch talks. Uh, and uh, they'll be very diverse in topics. Thank you. <laughs>